The Rose Kennedy Greenway is one of the few places in Boston where you can go to find new art opening right now. The public park is presenting works by world-renowned artists, including Catalina Delgado Trunk and Yinka Shonabare. We'll speak with Shonabare in a moment, but first, a lay of the Greenway. Looming large over Ring's Fountain on the Rose Kennedy Greenway is a visual anthology of mythology. This work, titled Global Connections, Mesoamerican Myths, the Domestication of Nourishment, and its Distribution, was created by Catalina Delgado Trunk, a Mexican-American artist who specializes in cut paper. Here, the paper has been blown up to massive proportions to tell a larger-than-life creation story. Her work is really based around the narratives of uh, Mesoamerican folklore as well as food culture and how food kind of transcends boundaries. And then as you make your way down into um, the artwork located uh, next to the fountains, you'll see the production of work and how food is actually produced and made. Lucas Cowan is the curator of public art on the Rose Kennedy Greenway. He says unveiling new public art, even in the midst of a pandemic, was a priority. We are a democratic park, open to all. And I think one of the really important aspects of the public art program is creating free democratic artworks that can really speak to the times of now. And I think the works that we have here, they're bringing new culture, cultural ideas or issues that um, really need to be spoken about. Also now on view is this flowing sculpture by artist Yinka Shonabare. Part of his Wind Sculptures series, this solid 22-foot tall design only appears to have been molded by the Greenway breeze and stands as a metaphor for cultural exchange. I recently sat down with Shonabare via Zoom to learn more about his work. Yinka Shonabare, thank you so much for being with us. You're coming to us from London today. Yes, thank you for inviting me. Well, let's talk about your piece to start on the Greenway. Before we even talk about what it looks like, tell us what it does and how your wind sculpture engages or doesn't engage with the wind, as the case may be. Well, I mean, Wind Sculpture is a series I started after I made a uh, sculpture in Trafalgar Square. And that was a ship in a bottle with this kind of very windy sails. And then I thought that the actual sails themselves look amazing. And, um, and so, you know, I want to find a way to bring art to the public in a fun way, but also art that's culturally meaningful. So the fabrics I use on those sculptures are based on a batik. And so that sculpture is a way of talking about something that's actually relevant and uh, relevant to the identity of a lot of people, but also a way to actually make a really dynamic uh, public sculpture that's really colorful that will, in a way, interrupt the grayness sometimes that you might find in modern cities. I was really struck by something, a way you described your art and, and the engagement you hope that people will have is a, a magical way. Uh, that's a magical word. What do you mean by that? Oftentimes, people can be sometimes uh, intimidated by art or maybe think it's not for me. But if you can find a playful way to actually bring people in. You know, we all remember from, from childhood how important play and magic is. If you can find that, that magical side of it, and then you can actually make it accessible, then people may want to ask further questions. And so, you know, you can start with something that's magical and playful on the surface, but then you can move on to actually being able to teach history, identity, and then you find that our, our collective stories are embedded in these works. Well, to talk a little bit about your story, I was so fascinated to learn about how you came about your, your maverick streak as a young student. You're, you're raised, born in England, go to Nigeria where you're raised, and you're told that you have to make African art as a teacher looks at you, and you said no. <laughs> Yes, when I was at college, I was making work about kind of global issues. And uh, my tutor at the time said, why aren't you making authentic African art? And then I thought, well, you know, I'm a citizen of the world like everybody else. Of course, I don't mind making art that, uh, you know, that that's actually has my story in it. I don't mind that. But 
I want to feel that I can actually have the same freedom to travel and make work about whatever I want to make work about. What do you think art's role is in a moment like this? We, we talked about your piece at the outset and getting people to think, but is there a, a place for art to be made right now, just in this moment, to have the conversation in this moment and not taking the, the longer time to digest and, and con be contemplative about it? Well, I mean, I think there's always uh, room for both. You know, artists need to respond to what's going on. And I think both things can actually co coexist. But I think art is very important in, in understanding our moment in history. You know, if you look at a lot of historical art, you can pretty much figure out, you know, what was going on at the time. So artists are, are in a way, like almost like historians of time. Well, keeping that in mind, that history, we, we see uh, here in this country and in the city, in Boston, statues that have very much come under question that represent history, but they are also created by artists. I know it's happening in your country. We've seen statues topple into the Thames. Do you believe that those statues should come down? If people were slave owners and they expressed the views that we don't necessarily agree with now, you know, that will be based on community consensus because, you know, you might be offending one half of your population by keeping those statues there. The statues shouldn't be destroyed. Uh, they should be placed in museums so that people can actually learn about our past. And I think that's a very important point because we don't want people to forget and then repeat the same mistakes. So I think there is room uh, to create spaces where we can all learn about our past, but I certainly wouldn't advocate a mass vandalism. That's not uh, what I would av advocate. And finally, before I let you go, I have to ask you a question about, uh, we saw your piece, The American Library, in an exhibition here about migration at the Institute of Contemporary Art, where you had volumes that represented the lives of so many Americans that we know know, know so well, uh, but their own stories of migration and their heritage were vital. But there was also a volume of Donald Trump in there. And I had been wondering ever since I saw that about why you included the, the president, such a polarizing figure, of course, uh, in The American library? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, Donald Trump is also part of American history and he shares the immigrant story. And so I'm not really going to make a judgment about, you know, about people, you know, I, I just want to, to have the facts, you know, I mean, he also shares that, uh, you know, that migration story, uh, his heritage. And I think it's, um, you know, quite, um, appropriate that is is um, is part of that story because that is Donald Trump's story. Well, Yinka Shonabari, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Nice to see you. Yeah, thank you.